and, and had that moment that you see on the soap operas and you see on TV with a father and son together and says, I love you and I love you, son, and all that. So I wanted to be with him and have that moment. And I can remember maybe 12, 10 or 12 days ago being over at the house and the morning home care, or the all-night home care service had left and my uh, the uh, morning session had not gotten there yet. My mother was in the bedroom. My sister, Robin, was upstairs. And I was in the room with my father. He was laying back in the reclining chair. It was laid down like a bed and had a... Uh, uh, blanket over and resting kind of uncomfortably and I was just me and him in the room the uh, room was dimly lit the door was shut it was just he and I I said I'm going to tell him I've never told him I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finally tell him I love him and I'm in the room and uh, he's you can tell he's kind of resting uncomfortably but his eyes would pop open he'd, he'd flinch just a little bit and his eyes would pop open and go back I said I'm going to tell him I'm gonna, next time I, I'm going to tell him and I'm having a debate with God I said well God why is this so hard I mean God is love. That's what you are. Why should I have this much trouble saying this to my father? So finally, I was laying there, and the, and the hospice had set up what they call a, a hand-holding chair where you sit there and hold his hand. I've never held a man's hand, much less tell him I love him. But anyway, I'm sitting in the chair. His eyes pop open. I said, Dad, I said, I love you. And he looked over me and said, Thanks, I appreciate that. And I said, Yeah. <laughs> I said, I said, Dad, gum, I've waited 67 years, and this is it. I waited for this moment. <laughs> and there's one other thing I wanted to see from him. Uh, as I said, I'd done a lot of Christian speak with my father once we both got out of coaching. He would always make this statement. He said, I know I'm going to heaven. He said, I know I'm going, but I'm not homesick. You know, I'm going to go tomorrow. So I knew that when he passed away, and I wanted to be there for his final breath, I knew he was going to have a smile on his face. Was he was going to heaven, he was convinced he was going to heaven, and I wanted to be there taking the last breath where I could see that smile on his face. And I had read all the books and seen the movies where somebody had passed away for a few minutes and, and they see the big light, uh, tunnel of light, and, and Jesus meets them and his hand's there and you can see heaven in the background. And I just knew my father was going to be smiling uh, when he had that moment. I didn't know when he was going to pass away, but I wanted to be there. And that same morning, I was sitting in a room, and I was holding his hand, and he would shake just a little bit, and his eyes would pop open. So they popped open one time. I said, Dad, I said, can you see heaven? He says, what? I said, can you see heaven? He says, what, the movie? And I said, there. He said, no, I hadn't seen him. And uh, that's the kind of guy he was. He's just a simple guy. I took all them books I had and threw them away because I said, well, that, that's not true. That's not true. But uh, great legacy. And uh, uh, one of the things, the legacy he left with me, I don't know if we have this picture up, I was going to show you. At my house, uh, a couple of times I was at Clemson, the plane would get fogged in, I'd go spend the night at the house. And for 30 years, I'd go down those stairs, no matter how long ago it was, it'd be 4, uh, 5, 5, 15, 5, 30 in the morning. That's what he'd be doing. That's what he'd be doing. And if you can look what he's doing right there, he's obviously he's got the Bible in front of him, he's reading the Bible. He just didn't read the Bible. If you look to his left, you see those study books. He, he studied the Bible. That's what he did. He did it for about an hour every morning. Consequently, that's what I did. Uh, 30 years ago, I started doing the same thing. I'd, get, I'd always read my Bible, but I didn't study it. He studied it, so I started studying the Bible. Yeah, it's been the last 30 years. I've probably read it through six times. It takes about five years of time. And, and I can remember, I started to say, well, I'm getting me some pretty good knowledge. I'm going to go down to my father. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quiz him a little bit and see how much he's been learning from those books. And I took it. So that's how I remember my father. Uh, Coach Andrew said, I wonder what he did at home. I know that, that's what he did. And so I went in there and I said, I said, Dad, I said, listen. I said, I've been reading this Bible like you. And I said, you know, the Bible's got some pretty big words in it. I said, you know what those words mean? And he said, no. I said, well, yeah, they're in the Bible. Don't you think you all know what they, what they mean? And he looked over him. He took him glasses, ringling, he slung back over his nose. He said, son, he says, all I know is John 3, 16. And that was him. John 3, he didn't care about them big words. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believed with him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That was it. That's, that's all. He didn't care about the big words. He was just a, he was just a simple guy. And that's all he, all he really got from the Bible, the most important thing. 
another skill that he had. Or, or one more thing about that. And, you know, I remember also asking my father, if you ever saw my father interviewed, he would say, I felt like I was called to go into coaching. I felt like God led me to go into coaching. It was God's will that I go into coaching. He would always say that. And the one thing I learned from my father from that picture is that if you're ever into that, you better know the Word of God. You better study it, and you'll find out the direction he wants in your life. And the other thing, the, uh, in, uh, in our den in, in Morgantown, West Virginia, but he took about 8 to 10 bricks, and he put them over here at 8 to 10 bricks, about 10 feet away, and he took a 1 by 12 piece of wood, he stained it, and he'd stick it on the bookshelf, and he'd stack 8 or 10 more bricks, and he'd put that piece of wood on there, 8 or 10 more bricks, and he built an L-shaped bookshelf in the corner of the room. And at that time, I was think I was 12, going on 13 years old. But I'll never forget the first thing he put up on that bookshelf. He took a little piece of paper and he hand wrote it at that particular time. He wrote this verse, Joshua, you will serve years later. You go to his house out there on Killarn. You go in his den on the bookshelf. Is that picture right there. Choose you this day whom you will serve. But for me and my me. That's the legacy he left for my children. If you take that picture where he was reading, he was reading about Jesus Christ. You've heard him mentioned several times, several people that have mentioned meeting in Jesus Christ. But as he read about Jesus Christ, he passed that legacy to me. Because of that, I know Jesus Christ. My wife knows Jesus Christ. My son knows Jesus Christ. My daughter knows Jesus Christ. Her husband, legacy to leave your children, a, children, a legacy of influence. That's what my father left me. And my four left me through my wife, through my son, through my daughter. My four rugrats are going to have a chance to meet him. Thank you. which friend, which booster. He cared for everybody. <laughs> he cared for everybody about the same. And I think that was the, the one thing, the compassion and love that uh, my father has had for everybody. I know we love the story in the Bible, the Sermon on the Mount where Christ fed 5,000. But we need to go back and remember he fed 1,000 one at a time. And that was kind of the way Dad did it. He, he shared his faith and his love for everybody one at a time. It's funny, the story I love to tell about, you know, which, which was his favorite. We were at church one day visiting my grandparents in Birmingham. Uh, you've heard some of him tell this story, but we were there visiting Rahama Baptist Church. That's where my mother and father grew up. She was 14 years old in the choir when she moved into town. He was 17, so on the back row, not paying a whole lot of attention, except to that 14-year-old up in the choir. And uh, that's where they went to church years ago. And we went back as a family years later visiting my grandparents. And the church was there. And we sat down the front row, mother and father on each end, six of us children in between. And the preacher was a guest speaker. And I think he was giving a revival or something like a revival. And he was getting excited talking about faith. And he was getting involved and getting excited. He began to stomp and he began to sweat and slap that Bible. And you know what it means when you get into a revival type deal. He was getting into it. And just like some Baptist preachers tend to do during a sermon, he saw my dad in the front row next to all of his kids, and he pointed at him and said, Hey, sir, do you have faith? Of course, all of us kids kind of looking at my dad, you know, and he said, Well, yeah, I've got faith. And that pastor said, Well, if you have so much faith, if I took a balance beam and stretched it across the floor down here in front of the pulpit, would you walk across that beam for $100? And all of us kids looked at him, you know, and he said, well, Yeah, I got, I got that kind of faith. Sure I would. Sure I would. He said, but sir, if I took that same balance beam and I, and I put it across two high buildings, then would you walk across that beam for $100? <laughs> he said, no, no, I wouldn't do that. We're staring at him, you know, no, I wouldn't do that. And then that preacher said, but sir, if I hung your child over that other building, then would you walk across that beam for $100? And I remember my dad so much. He looked at all those kids. He looked back and said, which one? 
and I, and I never knew which one quite he cared the most about. We all kind of had us guessing after that, but we all kind of guessed which coach did he love the most, which player did what did he love the most. But don't we all think it was us? Didn't he all make us think that it was us? Now, if your name is Buddy or Gal, don't get too excited, because most of the people, as y'all have already said already, uh, if you wasn't quite sure who you are, were Buddy and Gal. But you know what? How many people are walking around today? See, I love the way he called me Buddy. <laughs> And I love the way he called me gal. They're not saying, we didn't know my name. He didn't know my name. A man of great God, kindness. And I think about what of the scriptures always reminded me of Father, because he was inspirational. He was tough. We saw coaching when he was young, my brothers and I who played for him and, and coached with him when he was a lot more fiery than you may remember him being on that sideline as an older coach. But man, he could get after it now. And he did. He was fierce. And he was inspirational. He was motivational. But that's not the father I remember, and I don't that's, think that's not the Christian he wanted to be. I remember him being kind. I remember him being kind and being thoughtful. And when you walked into his office, he looked you in your eyes, and he, and he cared about you. He cared about you. And I talk about the Scripture and what it says. I know Ephesians 4.1.2 says, Live a life worthy of your calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing one another in love. You know, Christ only described himself one time in the battle in the Bible. Not as a revolutionary, not as a martyr. He described himself one time in the Bible. He said, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And I think my father and his desire all his life to be Christ-like, his desire to be Christ-like, was to be kind, gentle, humble, and loving. And to be quite honest with you, all you out there who knew him personally and knew you intimately, isn't that the Bobby Bowden you knew? Isn't that the Bobby Bowden who made an impact on you? Not the screaming, not the hollering, not the shouting or the standing, but that personal feeling of seeing you there and wanting to be kind and wanting to be gentle because he tried every day to be the best he could to be like Jesus. And that's what Jesus was all about. I wonder sometimes we say, I wish I knew what God was like. Your dad always said, we know exactly what he's like. He's like Jesus. He used to love to tell the story when he was about, about sharing his faith, what it was like to know God about when he was young after practice. And he was so thirsty and he wanted to get some orange juice to drink. You might remember he would come into the, the line at the, at, the, at the cafeteria and he would want that whole big vat of orange juice. And he wanted the whole thing and drink the whole amount. I could have it all, but he had, all he could get was that one little glass. And he'd pull that glass and he'd drink that little glass of orange juice. And he'd say, man, it's so good. And he couldn't have that whole big thing up in that vat, but he could drink that one glass of orange juice and know it was exactly what was in that vat. And that's how he felt about Jesus and about Christ, that he knew God and knew how to act like God. He was kind and gentle. That's what he wanted to be. My dad always felt that football was a priority of his life, that we would not win at FSU when we were there unless we made football a priority. And I just spoke to my team thinking back, having gone through what we've gone through the last couple of weeks, I had my State of the Union address just a week ago. And I said, we're not going to change ULM. We're not going to go from an 0-10 team. We're not going to go from a team that never led one game unless we make football a priority of our life. But let me tell you something. We will never get there if we make it the priority of our life. It will never get there if we make it the priority of our life because you'll lay awake with, the, with, this, with, with anxiety, with worry, with doubt, it'll become too important. We need to make football a priority of our life, but not the priority of life. Now, that's one of those secrets to success. I grew up in the 80s when you read all these books on attitude and secrets of success. That is the secrets of success. That is the secret of success. Don't make football the priority of your life. We love the verse uh, that, that Jesus, that we can be saved through Jesus and that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Don't we love that verse? It's one of our favorites, Philippians 4, 13. 
But Dad, Dad always felt it came right after, right after, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be gathered unto you. A priority, but not the priority. He understood that. Derek, you took my next verse away, the three things, faith, family, and football. That was the next things I told my team. We won't be successful here at ULM unless we do what my father taught me, unless we keep those three Fs, faith, family, football. In fact, it was players he taught me to throw education right there before football. Faith, family, education, and football for a young man who wants to get ahead. And football, you can, you can substitute anything in life you want to substitute. If you want to get his message or the message, just substitute whatever you want into number four, but never make number four, number three, two, or one. That's what Dad always talked about, and that's what he did, and that's what he lived, and that's what I remember so much about my father. He made football a priority of life. He never got too far away from football. Tommy had a story the other day. We were, we've all enjoyed, we enjoyed being able to be with him in his final days. And we enjoyed getting a time to go back and spend time with my father, knowing from our doctor that these days were getting shorter and the end was coming quicker. And we enjoyed our time with him in so many ways. Uh, one last comment, one last hand squeeze, one last look as we, as we came together. But he always loved football and his heart was never very far away from FSU football, I promise you. It was always a priority of his life. Just a week before he passed away, Robin was able to tell all of us, I'll tell the story of Robin. As she came home, she was spending a lot of time with mother. We can only thank Robin for all the time she spent there while we were off working and, and doing other things. But she came home one day from my mom and her maybe going to get, do, do mom's hair or something. And she came home and there was my dad sitting by the door. He had had Tasha, who helps us so much, get him dressed. And he was dressed in his khaki pants and his garnet shirt and he had his hat in his lap and robin said where are you going he says i got to get to the game he said i got to get to the game even those final days football was a priority of his life and it was fsu football that he loved so much football a priority but not the priority and I want to leave you all with, with this final thought. We, as a family, God has been so much a part of our lives through the blessings of having a mother and father that raised us as Christian parents. And so I, all of us asked each other, and especially my sister Ginger, if we could read a letter that he wrote to us as a family. It was September of 2004, and we never had had a real tragedy in our family. We had never had something we could go through that was devastating or tough and that we couldn't handle. But that was a tragic day in, in September because my sister Ginger's son Bowden and his father were killed in a car accident. Billy, Billy Smith came to the door to let us know. And we found out that week before the Miami game of 2004 that we had lost a family member for the first time ever. And oh my goodness, oh, as parents, do you don't want our children supposed to live longer than our parents. But it was something we didn't know how to handle and didn't know how to respond to. But we got a letter from my father and he wrote it to all of his children and we felt we were gonna, I was gonna read that to you. I know he would want me to, we all want you to too. And I think we're gonna have it up on the, uh, the, the uh, screen. This is the letter he penned to us. I wanna say it was in the airport. I wanna say it was on the way to Miami. Before a football game, days after that terrible event, he penned a letter to all of his children, and I want to read it to you, that says this. My dear children, when the de de tragedy occurred last week, I saw again the bond of love our family has for, each, has for each other. I witnessed the inner strength of Ginger in a time of mortal crisis and love of her mother, brothers, sisters, spouses, nephews, nieces, children, as well as in-laws and friends. Oh, how I love you all. This brought back the memory of when you were just children. Your mother would stay up half the night each Saturday, ironing and polishing your shoes. She would lay your clothes out systematically, and we would all go to church each Sunday morning. Now is a good time to reflect on where you came from. Ann and my number one goal was that we raise you in the same environment we were raised. I remember vividly 
the day you accepted the Lord and were baptized. The good news of this tragedy, tragedy is that John and Bowden were saved and today live again in the presence of God in their new heavenly home. It has been said that when we die, we can take nothing with us except one thing, our children. Great job, Ginger. Keep in mind, all this time, our family will be together forever if we trust in Jesus and surrender our lives to him. I don't mean change jobs or schools, but just make your life available to Christ as your grandparents did and Ann and I have tried to do. When I die and go to heaven, and I know I will, if all of you and your family are not there with me when that time comes, when your time comes, I will consider myself to have failed in life. All the statues, trophies, championships, etc., will be in vain. Somewhere along the line, I failed you if you are not there. Now is the time to recommit our lives to Christ, just as you did as a child. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I choose Jesus as my Savior and commit to him each night. This is my fervent prayer. Hear our prayer, O oh Lord. Thank you. Serving as a senior pastor is a high calling, and serving as Coach Bowden.